or converts who join the church later in life. It's something that, um, that we have to work through, that we have to uh, discover, not just through book learning, not just through listening to speakers, but through experience of being in the church. This is something that I think those who grow up in the church have an advantage over converts in, is that growing up in the church and being surrounded by the life of the church that um, understands and appreciates the Virgin Mary's role, uh, it becomes something that's maybe natural, maybe something that just sort of uh, naturally flows out of you, this love of the mother of God. For me, it's something that I have to struggle with. Um, and I have to struggle with it because um, of my baggage, baggage that probably a lot of you share coming from a Protestant background, which more or less, of course, there are different kinds of Protestants. But um, the evangelical background that I come from, the Virgin Mary is something that frightens us. Um, and, and what she can represent is sort of like a threat a threat to our devotion, our wholehearted devotion to Christ. Um, and that is because of this fear that the Virgin Mary will become like this goddess, like a pagan goddess, you know, separate from the one true God, and set up in um, sort of in competition with the one true God. And there's a kind of a basis for that fear, uh, especially when we look at certain cultures when they received the Roman Catholic faith and weren't completely educated in even that faith. And as a result, they sort of plugged the Virgin Mary into a role as a mother goddess, just like in their pagan past they had a mother goddess. And so when they accepted Christianity, they weren't fully catechized, and, and they just kind of uh, renamed their mother as the Virgin Mary. And so they treated her in a way that's not actually in conformity with the ancient faith of Christians. Um, so the, that's where this fear comes from. Um, but the fear is exaggerated, and it's based on that misunderstanding. It's based on that misunderstanding. So, before we talk about the Virgin Mary in particular, I want to talk about the saints. Because, of course, the Virgin Mary is the highest of saints. She sort of epitomizes the role of saints in our lives, but, but there's this whole context of devotion to saints that the Virgin Mary fits into. When we think about the saints and their role in our lives, um, it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. And really, it's about very natural relationships that happen in this world in the church. Okay. Why are the saints important to us? Because we share with them this Christian faith. We share with them a love of Christ. We share with them membership in the church. We share with them a devotion to the gospel of our salvation. We have a relationship with them. Now, what, what's the source of their power? The source of their power is their relationship with God. Their relationship with God. It's not as if there's some kind of um, sorcerers or magicians or demigods or, you know, that they have some autonomous power um, apart from them. But the source of their power is, and the source of their knowledge is Christ himself. Protestants are very comfortable with having these kind of relationships in this life. You know, in every Protestant church, there are prayer warriors who, when you have a problem, you go to them. You call them up on the phone. You say, "I really need you to pray for me." Now, 
when we go to the saints and ask for their prayers, um, the sort of Protestant voice in me says, why can't you just go directly to God? Well, you can. But why do you call the prayer warrior? Ask for their prayers. Why don't you go directly to God? There's some kind of significance to sharing our struggles with others in the body of Christ. Not as being substitutes for God, but as being helpers to us in our struggles. And in particular, we look to those people, um, whether living saints or departed and reposed saints, we look to them because of their closeness to the Lord. Because we see in them um, a higher degree of union with God than we have. And that's something that inspires us and gives us hope. Because sometimes we don't know what to pray for. Sometimes we even lack the strength to pray for ourselves. Um, and so we look to these people as helpers, as advocates. Um, now, of course, the difference is that in a Protestant mentality, um, specifically the evangelical mentality, there is this great division between the living and the dead. The dead have nothing to do with, with us uh, from that perspective. And so there's it's, it's just ridiculous to offer prayers for those who have departed or to um, ask those who have departed to pray for us. They are just sort of on pause, our relationship with them is on pause, until we too die, and then we go into our and then we'll pick up where we left off. From an Orthodox perspective, our relationships continue after death. Um, of course, it begs the question, how can we have a relationship with those to whom we can no longer speak as we used to speak? Those who have passed beyond this veil and who are no longer a part of this life as we know it. How do we still have a connection with them? The answer to that is that we have connection with them through Christ. We have connection with them through Christ. I'm teaching a class on that and after that. On Wednesday nights, and I just began. And next week, this is actually a topic that we're going to be speaking about. Um, how can the saints hear our prayers? The answer of the church fathers is that they not only hear our prayers, but they watch over us, they have knowledge of us, not directly, but through their relationship with Christ. So if you can imagine that in paradise, Christ is the center of paradise, and all of the righteous departed are surrounding him. And as was their hope in this life, they are continually in his presence, soaking up his presence, gazing upon him, loving him, and in union with him. But Christ has knowledge of us through his divine uh, omniscience. And through their union with him, they share in that knowledge that he has of us. And this is something the saints tell us, that holy people, even in this life, have. You've heard of saints, of, uh, of clairvoyant elders, who know things that there's no way that they could have known. They have knowledge of the future, they have knowledge of things far off, and they have knowledge, in particular, of things that are hidden within our souls, the secrets that we've told no one. And that's knowledge that Christ has given them through their union and their connection with Him. And the saints who have departed this life have the same type of knowledge of us. Now how can they affect our life? This is another thing. Well, they're, they're past beyond this veil. They no longer even have bodies um, to be able to um, Affect to, to, to live out their life through their bodies. And that's one thing from an Orthodox perspective. A soul is not a complete human being. A soul in a body is a complete human being. So even the souls of the righteous departed the life, they don't even have bodies with which to complete their human existence. Um, in a sense, 
really, rightfully, they should not be able to act apart from their bodies. It's really a natural state to have a soul separate from the body in the Christian perspective. So how do they have power to help us in this life? Again, that power comes through Christ. That power comes through Christ. Um, they are Christ's agents. And um, when they worked miracles in this life, just as they were working miracles from the young people there, they are expressing God's power towards us. God is working through them, manifesting His power through them uh, to help us. So that's the background in terms of the saints. Where their power comes from, comes from where their connection with us comes from. But particularly the Virgin Mary. Why the Virgin Mary? Of course, she is one of the saints. She is one of those holy people who have that connection with God that enables them to be of special help to us. In fact, she is the holiest of the saints. She is the chief of the saints. And therefore, we can have great um, hope in her. But beyond that, it's her special relationship with Christ as being his mother. There are several hymns that use this phrase, motherly privilege, or motherly boldness. I think we heard it tonight. That she has motherly boldness um, to come before the Savior to whom she gave birth in the flesh, and to entreat him in our behalf. We saw an example of this in the Gospel, the marriage feast of Cana. Remember the marriage feast of Cana, where Christ is present there with his disciples, and he's just one of the guests. They run out of wine. The Virgin Mary discovers they run out of wine, and she comes to her son and says, they've run out of wine. And what does he say? He says, why are you bothering me? <laughs> what have you to do with me? My time has not yet come. And yet, without flinching, she doesn't react against him and say, you know what? You know, Listen, boy. <laughs> I carry you in this womb for nine months. <laughs> no, she just turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Just do whatever he tells you. No pressure, son, but... Um, and he does. He works a miracle. He turns the water into wine. And there are some of the fathers who interpret this passage and say that the Virgin Mary actually, through her intercession on behalf of this wedding, she brought our Lord you know, the time that he was to begin his ministry to be revealed. Because he says to her, he says, what, why are you asking me? My time has not yet come. And yet then he does perform this first of his miracles. That her supplications have that power. Now, of course, we'll say Christ, as the divine Son of God, you know, knew everything that was going to transpire. This was not something that sort of he changed his mind because it's impossible for God to change his mind. God knows everything that's going to happen and he's already uh, established his will for humanity uh, and every detail of his will for humanity from before he created us. But Christ um, in his humanity gives us this example of the Virgin Mary as an intercessor in order to encourage us in order to show us that when we feel like um, Christ is just sort of minding his business and that his time to help us has not yet come, that we have someone there who can intercede for us. Someone who has a connection to Christ, someone who loves us, because the Virgin Mary, as the mother of Christ, is also the mother of the body of Christ, the church. She's the mother of every Christian. Remember at the cross, uh, when Christ was dying on the cross, 
at the foot of the cross was standing Luke, the Virgin Mary, and we say St. John, but in the Gospel it literally says the beloved disciple. St. John is not named in his Gospel. Um, but it says the beloved disciple, the one who Jesus loved, who leaned his uh, breast, or leaned his head on Jesus' breast during the supper. And what does Jesus say? He says, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. That is a specific historical meaning in that St. John took the Virgin Mary and, and cared for her. But also there's a theological meaning that everyone who is a beloved disciple of Christ, Christ um, hands them over to his mother to be their mother, and likewise um, entrusts his mother to them. Christ created that connection for us at the cross. So the Virgin Mary has this motherly boldness. She's the mother of all Christians. Um, and she has um, particular meaning for certain kinds of Christians. You know, like there's saints that we can identify with um, because their circumstances were like ours. And so we ask for their help in their intercessions because we feel like they can understand what we go through and what we need and can pray with, with special meaning because of that. The Virgin Mary uh, for mothers has a special connection because she herself was a mother. We don't read about all of Christ's childhood. We have very limited knowledge of her childhood. But he had a childhood. She had to raise her son and he you know, fell down and scraped his knee. And she had to comfort him. Um, she, as we read in the Gospel of Luke, was troubled when she didn't understand what was going on with, with her son as he was growing up and discovering and, and living out, starting to live out his calling from God. Um, as he was lost in the temple, she didn't know. Why did you leave us? What's going on? So she worried about him. Um, and she worried about God's will for him. So, for mothers, she has a special connection because she knows what it's like to be a Also, for monastics, monastics have a special devotion to the Virgin Mary. Why? Because she is the Virgin Mary. And as we learn from church tradition, she was a consecrated virgin. She wasn't just sort of like an accidental virgin. Like, uh, she never had a chance to get married, and therefore she didn't get married. But no, from a very young age, she was devoted to God in her, um, in her heart. She wanted to live a life of complete um, devotion to the Lord. Uh, putting aside all family life and all distractions of the world, and she was raised in the temple in a life of prayer and service to the Lord. And um, in this way, she is a model for monastics and also understands the difficulties that monastics go through. And so the monastics have a particular devotion to her, especially on the Um That's about all I have to say. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> Sorry, it's a lot of like, information. <laughs> but talking to stop talking. I have a question. Yes. Um, 
Well, I mean, I think it's maybe part of your question is, you know, how to put this knowledge into practice um, and, and how for it to become a part of who we are. And that's the problem that I mentioned at the beginning, which is, you know, for someone who grew up in the church, surrounded by this, it just makes sense to them because it's what they knew. And what we have to realize as converts, if we came from a background where the Virgin Mary was not appreciated or even like feared, which usually is the case, um, then we have to, um, first of all, you know, correct the um, misinformation that we've grown up with, um, which, and, and also fill in these big gaps that are left. You know, so there's an intellectual task to do, which is what, what I've been talking about right now, the knowledge, is understanding the role that she, that she has. Um, realizing that it's a biblical role. We just heard in, in the Gospel to St. Luke that I, that I read, that when the Virgin Mary came to Elizabeth, Elizabeth honored her, right? Elizabeth honored her and said, um, why am I worthy that the mother of my Lord should come to be with me? And when she said the mother of my Lord, she meant the mother of God. I mean, the Lord in uh, a Hebrew, in Hebrew culture was a substitute for the name Yahweh, uh, the name of God, which they could not pronounce. So, I mean, also the Virgin Mary says in the Bible, all generations will call me blessed. I heard a story about it. A Pentecostal pastor who was learning more and more about orthodoxy and he finally wanted to try to introduce it to his parish, to his church. And so he started a sermon series about the parts of the Bible that we skip over. And the first one was on this passage All generations will call me blessed. When is the last time that, these, that this congregation have called her blessed? It's in the Bible. You know? And that's something we have to face as former Protestants is that there is this. Biblical devotion to the Virgin Mary, which we which we've lost, we've been separated from. And understanding, like I just explained, that it doesn't have to do with her being this um, this autonomous power for, of her being like a goddess. It has to do with her being um, a, a mentor a guardian and, um, in, in, the, in the faith for us, um, as a fellow Christian with us, but a fellow Christian who is much more advanced than us. Um, and that, that, that that role has special, special significance because of her relationship with Christ and <clears throat> she So we have to correct the misinformation and be aware of the misinformation. Be aware that, that our natural impulse to be afraid of this action of praying to the Virgin Mary or honor her is wrong-headed. You know what I mean? But then it's, we have to do it in order to get over it. Because it's one thing for it to be fixed in our heads, but, it, it, but that knowledge has to sink into our hearts. Um, when I was catechumen, one of the priests that, that I was um, learning from, I asked him, I, that was like the last sticking point that I had, was the Virgin Mary. And he said, look, he said, you're not going to understand the Virgin Mary until you become related to her by becoming a member of the Orthodox Church. And to me, the importance of that is we understand the Virgin Mary through getting to know her in a relational way, in a relational way, in an everyday way. Um, you know, how do I become friends with Ed? It's not by reading biographies of Ed. I'm not going to become, you know, it's not by, even by talking to other people about it, but it's about by spending time with him. That's how I've been talking to him. So, and it's going to be a big relationship. You know, friendships are awkward at first, but, but you have to do it. If you want it, you have to do it. And, uh, and over time, I think 
we begin to get over our hang-ups and uh, it does become more comfortable and a little more natural. I don't know if it will ever be as natural for me to call upon the Virgin Mary as it is for Bishop David, who has a great natural um, devotion to the Virgin Mary. But it's becoming more and more natural. One of the things I stumble over sometimes, um, there are there's some prayers, um, like one that says, oh, I put all my hope in me. Yes. Um, and it's preceded usually by a prayer that says, my hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, yeah. my shelter of the Holy Spirit, yeah. which kind of helps me to understand that, and still yes. it's such an absolute, it sounds so absolute, yes. I put all my hope in me. When we read prayers, um, which and hymnography, we have to understand that they're forms of poetry. And so um, there are poetic, poetic uses of language, including like hyperbole. Um, but then we have to always understand in the, term, in the context of theology. But also we have other things like we heard twice today.